Coffee helps. Yes, coffee helps. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. I, yes, only barely made it. I, um, hang on, pop out chat. Here we go, getting myself organized. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, will, I will do the important thing. I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Wedjuk Noongar peoples. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to Aboriginal elders and peoples from other communities who may be taking part in this live stream today. So, good morning, everybody. Oh my, uh, I must be shaving my beard off. I did that a, a month ago, whenever it was. <laughs> okay, I just saw a comment from Steve the Squirrel who said, right, help if you are confused. <laughs> I'm gonna try that. I'm gonna put help in the chat. <laughs> And nothing happened. Uh, I am confused. <laughs> I have for basically ever since I started doing live streams years and years ago now. Oh, no, I did get something. Cool. Uh, <laughs> I um, set a backup alarm, which if it went off, would give me just time to get up, get here and be ready to start. But, you know, without leeway, it's the backup if everything else fails. In all these years, it's never gone off until today. <laughs> uh, yes. I was struggling to make it today. <clears throat> so, uh, I, do, I have not had much preparation time. I don't know if I've got everything organized. I think audio is working. But... Uh, yeah, I just had time to drink a coffee and that was about it. And it has not had time yet for the caffeine to hit my bloodstream. <clears throat> oh, yes, Mitchell. <laughs> we all have those days. Uh, open up text-to-speech. It's running, Mitchell. Uh, oh, which reminds me. There is a whole list of things, of people in here to say good morning to. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Good morning to Austin. David Crisp. Dodgy is here. Don S. Intermittent. Oh, Intermittent Tech is here. Cool. I don't think I've seen you for a little while. Uh, Jax Tech, John Whips, Johnny Bergdahl, um, Michael Wise, Mike Carden is here, Mitchell, of course, is here, Pancake Legend, Andrew, good to see you back again, uh, Scott Miller, some call it fun, uh, Stephen W, Wagon Loads, David Howes, Dion, Henrik is here. Uh, Henrik has something that he sent me a little while ago that maybe I will show on the stream today. Uh, Iggy is here, Crispian, uh, Sion, Moo Sion, Russell, Johan, Gavin, The Lane. <coughs> uh, you said slow morning, so I'm checking. Okay. Yeah, text to speech is running, and I tried it a little while ago. Hang on, I'm going to. A quick play intro. No, I won't do that now. I've already done that one. <clears throat> oh, Henrik says, I have a big problem now. My stomach is too full of chicken pasta. <laughs> it was too good. Oh, yes. All right. Enough randomness and trying to get my head into the game. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I didn't. I am so vague that I don't even remember. Did I stream last week? I don't think I did. I think I bailed last week because that was the week that I was feeling really bad, lots of pain, and just was not up to doing it. <clears throat> so it's been a couple of weeks. Yeah, no stream last week, says Stephen W. Yeah. Uh, so the, the summary on that is that my shoulder seems to be improving and... Uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks Austin. So Austin says, no stream, hope you had some uh, proper rest. Not really. That's been one of my major issues is that I haven't been able to rest, haven't been able to sleep because I've had a lot of pain through my back and shoulder. And so I've been sleeping in little chunks when painkillers work and when uh, stretching and all that sort of thing has done its job. Oh, James is here now too. <laughs> Good morning, James. So uh, I, uh, that was basically what happened last Sunday 
because at that point I'd had two and a bit weeks of almost no sleep and it had a cumulative effect. So by last weekend, I was just not up to functioning. I couldn't do it. <clears throat> and so, and I just couldn't get the rest that I needed to be able to recover because of the pain. So that is now uh, improving. I've done a few things. One is I switched to, um, okay, so right now I'm sitting here at my computer, which some of you have seen in person. I think most of you would have seen on video at least from walk arounds and things. So this is where I spend many, many hours every week, way too many hours. And that is a large part of the problem. The, um, the issue through my left shoulder is, uh, oh, Jordan's here too. Good morning and Celtic Beast. Um, so the, it's, it's made a whole lot worse because I'm sitting with my shoulder hunched forward, my left, or well, both shoulders, but the left shoulder sort of curls forward and puts it into a bad position. And so what I've been doing is the, um, Oh, Illuminator, good morning. <laughs> so what I've done is got my laptop and set it up on a standing desk stand sitting on the table at the front of the office. And I've been alternating between the two and spending as much time as I can standing at my laptop instead of sitting at this desk here. And uh, that has definitely helped relieving that uh, the pain across my back and shoulders being in a different position rather than spending so many hours here in a very static position. Being a lot more mobile has helped open that up and give me some relief and allow me to have a bit of rest. And yesterday, oh, and I've been doing, continuing to do uh, Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu, which has also been helping because that gets a lot of mobility back into it might seem strange that I have a shoulder injury. In fact, I have two shoulder injuries. I've got a torn rotator cuff on my right shoulder, and then I've got this uh, scapula problem on my left shoulder. And it might seem counterintuitive that doing violent, unpredictable, strenuous exercise, <laughs> like semi-uncontrolled exercise, would be good for it, but it's really helped. And it's helped get more mobility through it because it forces me to use more of a range of motion and it helps uh, keep the uh, keep my muscles in reasonable shape and um, compensate for things so that's good and yesterday I had a a, um, a therapy session with a myotherapist who is one of the guys that trains at the gym and that hurt like hell but that has really helped it's um, it's helped get my shoulder into a much better position relieve some of the tension of the muscles down my chest and uh, freed up some movement across my back. Anyway, that's enough of that. So, uh, I'm just moving some things out of the way of the camera there because I want to show you something in a moment, I think. So, this is the thing that Henrik has sent me. And before I get into this, uh, yeah, oh, um, Henrik said, has there ever been over 55 watches? How many are there now? Oh, there are 53, it currently says. Yeah, we've had over 80. In fact, there have been over 100. In the fairly early days during lockdowns, I think it, the highest number I've seen is like 117 or 125, somewhere in that region. <laughs> Um, oh, Stephen says, I thought you were about to say you got a spontaneous tattoo yesterday. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Maybe the, yeah, doing painful things can help. 750 gram. Someone was talking about, oh, okay. No, sorry. That was just dinner. Oh, right. <laughs> I, um... Now, there are going to be follow-up streams with Mitch for KiCad, and uh, we're going to continue that, I think, a little bit longer at least. And I, But the thing is that <clears throat> today I did not feel like 
um, the intense focus required for working on a project like that. Ooh, okay. Yes, James. <laughs> I will do that. James just suggested that I show some photos. Uh, yeah, so because there has been this big focus on KiCad over the last um, five weeks or so, there, uh, there are a whole lot of little things. So normally my streams are random small stuff. It's lots of chasing squirrels and whatever the thing is that I'm looking at at the moment. And um, there are a few of those topics that have accumulated. And uh, one of them is updates to the I2C RJ45 uh, breakout for the light switch controller. I did some changes to that a while ago and they never actually produced the boards. So, and then <laughs> chatting to James um, a day or two ago, <laughs> James suggested some changes that mean that I may continue editing that before I send them off for fabrication. Sorry, I'm just... All of this is waiting for... Uh, no, I do not want to take a survey, Discord. Stop it. All of this is waiting for Discord to open so that I can bring up some pictures. Okay, I'm going to go... Where are we? Open in browser and open this one. Oh, these look so nice. Okay. They're um, the kind of unif... Yeah. Ubiquity-like. Unify-like. Now, I will show you some pictures in just a second. <laughs> Have a lot of fun. <laughs> DIY, thank you. Good morning, DIY. Um, okay. Super chat. DIY in the ghetto says, have a lot of fun. Super Star chat. Struck. They sent $1.99. <laughs> Thanks, DIY. Uh, okay, I'm going to show you a picture now. How do I drive this thing? Where's the button? This one. Check this out. So, James has been working on cases for the, uh, the OXRS rack mount project. And... Check this out, it is so cool. So this is a case that he designed. Oh, look at the shape for the fan in the back with the, um, the swirly sort of shape on it. That looks really good. So you can see there is a board mounted in the front. I'm not sure if that's a Rack32 or if it's um, maybe one of Austin's boards. Um, but they all fit the same front panel uh, profile. Yeah. It does look really sexy. Look at this. The finish on this is really cool. Now, if this is... Is this steel or aluminium? Uh, so, James. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Austin said mine fits the same profile. Exactly. So, Austin's um, control boards will fit into the same profile. And I don't know if this is a Rack32 or if it's one of Austin's boards. So... Yeah, it looks steel to me, says Henrik, because of that brush sort of look. Now, what I found was that the um, the enclosures that I had made that were done in steel... Okay, it's a Rack32. Thanks, James. So, the ones that I had done in steel, um, I left them just as raw steel sitting on a shelf for a while, and they all went crazy rusty. They just ended up totally brown after a while because the um, the exposed metal didn't have any surface finish on it. <clears throat> yeah, James says the hole is for the 5mm LED. Yep. So usually there'd be a power LED or something in there. 1mm steel, says James. Great. Alright, so I really like this brushed metal look. Uh, but to leave it like that, I would coat it with something. Like spray it with clear uh, to protect it and stop it from rusting. And... Um, Oh, I used mild steel, I think. I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, uh, mild, yeah, James said mild for this one. So this is mild steel. Anyway, the point of all of this is James has done this awesome looking case. Uh, now that's just one of the pictures. So this is a, um, a close-up showing the fit. 
Look at how good the fit is on this connector. That is scary tight. I, I'd be worried about it, not quite uh, fitting. <laughs> oh, Scott says, imagine getting it made in copper. Steampunk IoT, that would look awesome. Uh, yeah, the fit on these RJ45 sockets is so precise. That looks fantastic. And then this is a view down. This is where the Rack32 would fit. And you can see it's got these uh, uh, nut spacer things that could be welded in, could be pressed in, I'm not sure. They're kind of like riv nuts, but... Uh, yeah, Hosson says, I'd be worried about the RJ45 fitment with heat expansion and contractions. Yeah, it looks pretty tight. Um, it's got these tabs on the side with nuts attached. If we zoom in there, so there's a nut on there, which means a cover can go on and then be screwed on from the side. And then these are the uh, the mounts, the threaded mounts for the Rack32. And you can see there's some other stuff sitting in the back. That, that you can see just sitting there, that is the edge, the back end of a Rack32. So presumably that is what gets mounted in here. So, oh, five millimeter riv nuts, says James. Yeah. Austin suggested needs an XT60 panel mount on the back for power. Uh, looks like James might have a different plan for power. So there are fan options. Anyway, this looks amazing, James. It looks so good. <laughs> I'm really torn between the like the pure white look, which is what I ended, what I did, and this brushed metal look. This brushed metal look is so cool. The um, the issue I would have with brushed metal is how to do labeling on it. If you would do labeling, because if you put a sticker on here, even a transparent sticker or something like a transparent sticker with a number on it for the port number the label will be fairly visible on the brushed metal. <clears throat> um, Guild, oh Guild is here too. Good morning Guild. Uh, Guild asks what is going on with the open KO stuff. Yes, that is a whole topic that I was going to talk about today as well. Like a, a broader picture. I'm going to keep talking about OXRS stuff for a moment but yeah, as I was kind of getting to before, there are a whole lot of these little things that haven't been mentioned for a while that all deserve an update and the KO situation is something that has been a big deal for me over the course of the week just gone so that is something that I will get back to so please remind me if I don't mention KO um, by the end of the stream. Jackstack says laser etch, Stephen W says laser engrave all the labels <laughs> Mr. Fixit said laser applied power coding labels. Okay, so <laughs> everybody thinks lasers are the solution to everything. And I can't disagree with that. <laughs> lasers are the solution to most things. <laughs> um, oh, okay, our guild says. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I'm just looking at these pictures and how good this is. <laughs> Doing custom metal work really takes this to another level. It's one of those, you know, those things where I can design a PCB, but a PCB on its own is not a product. It is just a, it is a part. It's an important part, but it's still just a part. It's when you put it in something like a custom enclosure like this that all of a sudden, it starts to look like a real thing. It looks like something that you have, you've bought from a proper supplier. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, James says, laser etch is an option, but it's quite expensive to get done. Hoping to keep this case sub $100 Australian. Uh, and oh, Mr. Fixit suggested powder coating. And uh, Gavin asked how did such great cutting get done? I think the answer to that would be either laser or water jet cutting. I don't know. Uh, James can, can answer that one. <clears throat> water jet, yep. 
Yeah, because I, I think laser cutting on this sort of thing leaves a slight burn mark on the edge of the, the metal. I could be wrong about that, but I think laser cutting on steel leaves heat artifacts and uh, water jet leaves a very, very clean edge. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, so good. Anyway, <laughs> uh, hopefully I will have one of these very soon because James said that he's going to send me one and uh, then I can show it on the stream in person, like for real. Instead of just looking at static pictures like this, I can I can wave it around in front of the camera and show you how nice this is. So James, did you uh, did you do a uh, a top cover for this as well? Now you can see on the back here there is another nut for attaching. There's a tab on the back that folds over, and then there is a nut for attaching the top cover. So this is obviously designed to have a top cover on it. You did indeed. Very good, James. Yeah, so this is going to come out looking like a, a proper professional device. It look With this brushed metal look, it does look remarkably Unify-like. I like it. Good work, James. Okay, so uh, something that I want to do fairly soon, probably corral corresponding with when I receive... Which way do I point? That way when I receive this is doing a general OXRS update because there has been um, there's been stuff happening there, <laughs> there are a few people actively doing things on it and uh, progress has been made there's been new firmware there uh, for the um, the controller boards and I think there might be some new expansion boards and things available uh, there, ooh, Scott says, could also powder coat it bright purple. <laughs> yeah, uh, bright purple. Like, um, who used to make purple rack mount stuff? I can't remember. Was it Sun? I know Sun used to do like a deep blue, but I think they also made some purple boxes. I can't remember. Yeah, Jordan says, I'd love to see this anodized deep blue. Yeah. Yes, that would be really cool. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, there is there is lots of OXRS stuff to talk about. I haven't talked about it for ages and I really want to. So I need to do an update on things like new firmware that has come out, these enclosures, which hopefully James will make available because um, I would like to buy some. <laughs> and... Mm -mm. Oh, Jay, uh, Austin was just saying I would do 0.5 millimeter clearance as the RJ45 jack plus heat expansion. Yeah, okay. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> regardless of clearances, <laughs> this looks so good. So I need to talk about uh, actually what I can do. I'm going to risk opening um risk uh, opening fusion all right <clears throat> because i'll just show you what i did in that now i think talking about fusion reminds me as i was uh trying to oh yeah there we go there was a <laughs> I saw that um, Sion had commented something about fusion and ground. I got a notification, but hadn't actually had time to read it yet. Maybe we will talk about that. Sorry, fusion is opening. Just got to make sure. Oh, it was in a client project. I've got to get out of that. <clears throat> uh, where are we? Superhouse projects. The I2C breakouts that I was doing uh, that I have done previously were designed in Eagle <clears throat> and a few days ago I pulled the 32 port version into Fusion so that's what I'm just opening up now here we go no not there not there and maximized yep that's all right okay so 
what I did was make a few changes. <sighs> I'm getting into this and I shouldn't. <clears throat> uh, does my space mouse work? Yes, kind of does. All right. <clears throat> so this is the 32 port version of the breakout, but it's been modified a bit since the version that you can, you've been able to buy. And you can see that it's slightly shorter and I stole the idea for tessellating these boards. I can't remember who. Was it Austin who came up with this original idea? Someone had the very cool idea of ending the breakouts on half of a screw hole, which means that you can, uh, if you've got four slots within the rack mount case, it means you can mix and match modules. So if you had a one unit version of this, you could put it alongside a one unit version of something else and then another two unit version of something else and then daisy chain them on I squared C. So the um, what I've did was modify all the different sizes to add uh, to make the edges this tessellated sort of version. Austin, yes, it was Austin's idea. Yeah, cool. Uh, and uh, a few other changes. I also added power breakouts on here at both ends. So power can be supplied like daisy chain through here as a high power connection, not just through the, the socket. Uh, what else did I do? I can't remember. I made a few changes anyway. And you can see that I made the whole thing deeper. It's Originally, the PCB ended just back here somewhere, and I made the whole thing deeper because there's plenty of room inside the rack. It really doesn't matter, and that gives room for more things. And uh, one of the ideas that James uh, was talking about was power control to each of these ports. Now, each of these ports goes to a light switch or a panel of light switches up to four buttons or whatever and the switches are illuminated. So James's suggestion was to add um, control of the power going to them using uh, PWM or something. So what we could do is dim the switches and still have them work. So that was a pretty cool idea. And uh, so what I might end up doing is put something like a PCA9685 on the back here in this extra space and use that for PWM control of the power to individual ports. And we've got, uh, so we would need, how many outputs are on a PCA9685? I think it might be 16 outputs. So we would need one for every pair of these. Although mm, that introduces complications. Creations said, "Take a look at my designs. I have power control already on the high side, which would allow for the lead control." Ooh, nice. All right. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So this is Austin's design, and this is where I shamelessly stole this idea from. So you can see the tessellation here that allows you to stack these modules side by side. And uh, what Austin's done is taken it back deeper, so there is. There are the two rows of mounting screws, and then there is a third row further back here. Uh, and I, yeah, I need to <laughs> start following Austin's standards more. What I should do is maybe expand it, make it even deeper, and add um, the, the extra screw holes on the back so that I'm compatible with Austin's boards. Uh, power control. Uh, per port power switching via external dip switches. Yeah. Okay, so these switches are used to control the power. Yeah. Uh, so that with that you could turn the um, turn power off um, to each of the individual ports. And the but yeah, what I was thinking of with can't get my words out today. Uh, so what James and I have been talking about was maybe adding PWM control on a per port basis under software control. So what you could do is on a bedroom light switch, for example, if the lights are turned off in that room, 
make the panel go dimmer or it could be at a certain time of night so that when you go to bed the, the light switch still glows but it's very dim and when it, and during the day it'll glow brighter so we're gonna if with PWM control we could adjust the brightness of all of the switches uh, yeah where are we I don't know <sighs> deep sigh um, oh Austin says I squared C power control would be as simple as plugging into the JST spots mm. interesting idea the JST spots ah oh, that's port power there okay yes so those connectors yeah I need to look at this in more detail oh okay I see so these are these switches are for the I squared C addresses of course they are I was totally misinterpreting that uh, Henrik said would it be easier to add a photoresistor with transistors to the button PCBs um, not necessarily easier just a different approach but having some kind of light sensing so this is starting to get into the, an area where the light switches are becoming smarter and that is a whole other approach which is perfectly valid and I've done that as well I've done a version of the light switches uh, that have uh, an ESP what, what did I use I think I used an ESP8266 in them I can't remember it's a couple of years anyway I did a version of the light switch which is compatible with the simple light switch controller but also allows RGB um, on the the illumination and uh, and all sorts of other things so with those yeah you could do that uh, so oh sorry about the yawn ESP8266 <laughs> Austin knows my boards better than I do <laughs> uh, Henrik asked do you need to remotely control the brightness it is useful to be able to remotely control the brightness yes it's it's not necessary but it is useful yeah um, and also being one of the other things is that if you can remotely control the brightness of individual buttons not the whole panel but individual buttons you could then show the state of whether the thing that it's controlling is turned on or off you could make it go brighter or dimmer depending on whether, whether it's on or off but that can't be done by controlling power from the light switch controller end because we only all we have is the 12 volts going down to the light switch and it's one 12 volt supply to the switch and it's all of the buttons come off that everything. control everything yes uh, yeah so being able to control individual buttons would require some smarts in the light switch all right so I'm kind of ending up diving into some of this RxRS stuff now anyway but uh, I don't really want to get into the um, uh, into it too deeply because I'm going <laughs> to I'm definitely going to do this properly very soon so once James's uh, rack mount thing arrives I will show that and uh, maybe what we could do is it would be um, a, a good live stream exercise to do some redesign on this board this is something that I could uh, I could do live now I want to have a look at the notifications because now that I've got fusion open I saw where are we I've got to find Sion's discord here we go unexpected maker oh Stephen said RS422 to your light switches yeah <laughs> yeah so once you get um, <laughs> there is a, a tension in the design philosophy here the a major point of the way my light switch design works at the moment is to make the switches 
as simple as possible and make them just switches on a piece of wire. Once you go beyond that and you start putting smarts in the switches and you have a microcontroller in the switches. Unexpected maker said I solved it. Read back, I chat, smiley face. Okay, cool. Um, sound solved the problem. Uh, but I'm curious to see. What channel was that in? So many channels in your Discord, Sion. So many channels. ECAD, ECAD something. ECAD Eagle Fusion, was that the channel? Probably. <laughs> um, yeah, how about CBUS support? Yes, once again. So, this is the thing. This could be done with RS422, with CBUS, could be done with CAN bus, could be done with all sorts of things. But it comes down to a philosophical question, not really philosophical, it's more of an engineering trade-off. I don't have anything against that approach. I think it's a good thing to do. Like it, it's a very worthwhile thing to do, is build light switches that have enough intelligence in them that they can do more than be a button on the end of a piece of wire. I don't have a problem with that at all. It's just that this particular project, the way that I designed this in the first place, was to make it as simple as possible. The particular design goal for this version was that you could just put a button or a switch on the end of a piece of wire and connect it back to the controller and it would work. You don't need anything else. There's no firmware in the light switches. There's no microcontroller in the light switches. The switches are just switches and they could be they don't even have to be special switches. They can be like standard clipsal wall mount switches. And if you put the um, the light switch controller into like a toggle mode, where it's not a push button, but it's a normal switch, you could have all of your standard light switches in your house and they would seem to work exactly the same as before. And there's no intelligence in them. It is just mechanical contacts. That was my goal with this particular um, approach. I wanted to uh, make something that would work with just switches on the ends of bits of wire. Uh, now, I do also like doing other things that have more capabilities. Um, oh, Austin pointed out, we support CBUS switch support, but not CBUS itself. Yeah. Um, oh, Dentistry says, I've been looking into RS-485 for light switches but because it has to be a continuous loop, the signal would go to the switch, then back to the controller, which would send it to the next and so on. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, that is an issue. Uh, but it could be LIN bus, um, etc. Yeah. Uh, there, are, there are many, many options for how you could approach that. <clears throat> hmm. Sorry, I've got to take a pause to <laughs> reset my brain. I'm going to mute for a second because I also need a drink. Ah, oh, right. Whew. Now. <clears throat> Yes. Mitchell R said C O F F E E E. Yes, I had a coffee very quickly right before the stream started. <laughs> I think I need another one. I actually have a um, a big container of iced coffee in the fridge, but I'm resisting going to get some of that. <clears throat> uh, tea is better or chocolate? <gasps> Wish I had some chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any here. Um, right, so Stephen said you would have a different board for a smarter switch version. You wouldn't need the I.O. expanders. Yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, and the connections could potentially be different as well. Uh, what you could do is use something like a RJ11. Um, because what you could do is have... Oh, no, not if it was RS-485. 
Uh, but okay, theoretically, what you could do is run uh, similar to telephone cabling. You could have four connections, so you've got ground power and then you've got two data connections like TX and RX or whatever the equivalent is depending on your bus. It could be CAN high, CAN low, or it could be like LIN bus or serial, whatever, it doesn't matter. So instead of having eight connections going to each of the switch panels, you could have four. So this could be gangs of RJ11 connectors. Are they RJ11? I can't remember. Let's have a look. What? And also the thing is that I know RJ45 and RJ11, etc., are not really the um, the correct termination, the correct names. Uh, they are modular jacks. So okay, so RJ stands for registered jack. Here we go. RJ11 is a type used for telephone cables. It has four or six pins. Yeah, and then there are other variations as well. Uh, images, here we go. So you could do it with the four pin version of RJ11. RJ12 is six pin, 11 is four pin from memory, says Stephen. Yep. Uh, Stephen also said 485 and 422 depends if you want full or half duplex communication. <clears throat> Jack's tech says a week out from Easter and no chocolate sacrilege I know I, <laughs> I should Easter eggs are not the most economical way to buy chocolate in terms of um, grams of chocolate per dollar <laughs> but uh, I am tempted to get some Easter eggs um, Austin said oh yeah just before I get back to Austin's thing and Henrik says, let's say in this year you'll get more chocolate, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, I will. I will. I'll probably get a package from Henrik with chocolate in it. <laughs> uh, so Austin said, if you need that amount of smarts at a, sw at a switch, it's better off with the touchscreens and PoE. It's far cheaper overall and cleaner looking. That is a good point. Yes. What I've been... Uh, mm, yes, it, a qualified yes, Austin. <laughs> I agree that using touchscreens, uh, I'm not so sure about it being cheaper. It's borderline. Those little touchscreens are kind of remarkably cheap. The ones with an ESP8266 in the back of them, um, like the WT32 series touchscreens. I don't know that they'd be cheaper than some buttons and an ESP32 though. Uh, and the issue, wondering whether to chase this. I will chase this squirrel very briefly. The issue I've had is that anything that is a light switch that doesn't look like a normal factory light switch, factory. A normal, you know, common light switch that people interact with every single day confuses the hell out of them. Buttons confuse people. If they walk up to a light switch and it's a, and it's a button, they don't just go, oh, I'll just press the button. They go, I don't know what to do because it doesn't look like a normal light switch. And going to touch screens is probably another step beyond that. It is cool though. Yeah. Uh, oh, Jackstech says, go to Cadbury Factory Outlet in Ringwood. What? Cad there is a Cadbury Factory Outlet in Ringwood? Hang on. <laughs> you know that, that I'm on Google right now. Cadbury Factory Outlet, Ringwood. Although I bet that they're not open on Sunday. Cadbury in Ringwood. Uh, Cadbury, where is this? Mondelez? Is that it? Just near the Manhattan? No. Uh, there, Cadbury. Hmm. Don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to have to check that out. Oh, that is pretty cheap. Technobula says 4.2 inch touchscreen with the SP32 bomb cost would be around US 30 bucks. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. But then you do have the um, uh, 
the total brain misfire. Yes, okay, the purport cost of the PoE switch. All right, so someone just recently, I've gone blank on who it was. I was talking to someone just recently via chat about doing a DIY Ethernet switch. So if that person is in the chat now, please speak, please speak up. Oh, Scott says, touch screen with an image of an old school light switch. That's funny. <laughs> Um, however, the one thing that I do have against touch screens as light switches is the fact they're not tactile. Oh, Dentistry says, I mentioned it a few months back, the switch that is, yes, the Ethernet switch. Yes, I think it was you. And um, a few, quite a few years ago, I did some contracting work on a custom Ethernet switch with a, an unusual PoE setup. It had modules, so the Ethernet switch itself had modules that plug into the back, and unexpected the, maker said add haptics to it as well. Yeah, add haptics to it as well. <laughs> so um, Sion has been working on an update to his uh, watch project. I have his watch right here somewhere. Uh, it was here. I'm sure it was here. Yes, here it is. So this. Oh, is this the? It's, um, sorry, <laughs> i got to show this off just because it looks so cool. Uh, let's switch to overhead. Yes, we're chasing a squirrel here, but it's a funky squirrel. <laughs> for those of you who haven't seen um, this project that Sion has been doing for a little while, this is his DIY um, watch. Yeah. So it's got an ESP32 in it, and um, there's a touchscreen. The screen on this is so sexy. It's got these rounded corners. It's designed specifically for smartwatches. So it's got all these rounded edges, and it's just, it's nice. So that's a, um, that's a touchscreen. I won't, I was just gonna say I won't power it up now, but what the hell, maybe I will. If I can get a cable that is long enough that will get me power, to reach to under the camera. Ooh, it's gonna be a stretch. Oh no, I can do this, I can do this. If I drag this across. And uh, Sion is working on a revision. So a revision of this, which adds haptics, which is um, uh, like feedback that you can feel. You know, like when, is this gonna power up? Oh yeah. Oh, maybe I've got a press one of the buttons. I can't remember. Maker said, nah, don't do it. Go back to your projects. <laughs> okay. Um, which one do I press to wake it up? Here we go. Tiny Watch S3. Wi-Fi done. So it's connected to my Wi-Fi. Anyway, the point of all of this, this is not entirely a, um, this is not entirely a, uh, thing. Oh, Wi-Fi reset because I don't have a battery plugged in. No, I don't know. Anyway, let's get off that. It is cool. It is super cool. But we'll get back to this. So, on a um, on a stream just recently, uh, Sion was showing some haptics. A little um, thing. There's a haptic controller, and uh, which is a, a chip that you can tell it to do different things like double tap or whatever and it will make it feel like someone has double tapped you on your wrist so what you do is you have the the little haptic motor which is the thing that physically moves and then there is a haptic controller and you it's got a whole lot of presets for these different patterns so if you want to send a notification to the person wearing the watch you use the haptic controller and it takes care of making the motor uh, move in a way that gives you that particular sensation. So the, um, where are we? Light switches. <laughs> uh, yeah, so what we could do is have some kind of feedback in the touch screen, but that is not quite the type of uh, tactile feedback that I'm thinking of. What you can do is, so there are two parts of it. 
this, what we're talking about here is the second part, which is feedback from an action. When you touch a touch screen, you can feel like a, um, a, a click or a tap or something, which is the haptic feedback, making you feel that you have um, touched the correct thing. But the, the other half of it, and this is what I think is the critical half, is touching the right thing in the first place without looking at it. And that is where physical light switches, I think, have a, a really big advantage over a touchscreen. Because usually when I'm using a light switch, I'll be, not, typically you're moving. Usually you'll be doing something like walking into a room. And so you reach out to the door frame not necessarily even looking at what you're doing. You reach out to the door frame, you flick the switch. And the reason you can do that is you can feel the location of the switch. You may glance at it in order to you know, get the general position, but then the actual fine motor control of touching it and activating it, you're not relying on your eyes at all. What you're doing is you are touching the switch and feeling the position of it. And a touch screen just can't do that. It can't provide that sort of thing. Now I did see a project a little while ago with touch screens that change their shape to give you the um, uh, that feeling. But uh, yeah, I can't remember where that was. That was a while ago. Uh, yeah, so for light switches that you walk past and activate while you're in transit. I am very heavily in favor of physical switches with tactile um, location and also with uh, tactile feedback. So you know when you've activated it, you can feel the click or whatever as you're activating the switch. But for me, knowing that you've activated it is kind of, it's still important, but that is of secondary importance to locating it in the first place, actually just reaching out, touching it, and you, the fact that you can feel it. Now, this is one of the reasons that I think large touch screens in cars is a really stupid idea. It's something that, um, it's obviously the trend at the moment, it has been the trend for a few years now. Companies, uh, I, well, Tesla was the obvious one that started it, just putting a massive touch screen in the middle of the dash and then controlling everything through it. Which means that if you're driving along and you want to adjust the temperature, for example, you can't reach over, feel the, um, the temperature control knob on the dashboard and just turn it without really looking at it. You have to look at the touchscreen and control your finger to know where you are touching on the touchscreen to press virtual buttons or drag a slider or something to change the climate control. And that is a really, really bad idea. Um, it's even worse if you have to click through screens and things to get to the thing that you want to control. So, yeah, Austin said, pretty sure places are finally creating laws against those touch screens. Yeah. <laughs> ah, Dentistry has also said, have you ever done anything with light dimming? No, I haven't. That's... Um, the, yeah, that is opening up a whole big thing. I haven't done anything with light dimming. I would like to. <clears throat> Scott Miller said, I have to take off my gloves to adjust the heat in some modern cars. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, Dentistry says, please check my one before. Okay. So I haven't done anything with light dimming. Uh, oh, okay. So Dentistry said, I've been searching and searching to get some of these buttons you have standardized almost engraved, so like uh, high, low, mid, or blind curtain, etc. Have you seen any? No, I don't think I have. I've seen, um, I'm just going to see if I can find something. I've seen them engraved. Uh, all right, I'm just going to have to do a little bit of quick AliExpressing. So LED button, I think it was 14 millimeter. I can't remember. Um, yeah, hang on. Let's bring this up. Do, 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 do. 
For some reason, AliExpress keeps thinking that I'm in Vietnam. So it keeps switching me across to the Vietnamese version of the site. Yeah, I've seen things like... Ooh, two colors. I haven't actually seen this before. That's interesting. Uh, oh, they're very shallow ones. That's kind of cool. Yeah, I've seen them with these symbols on them, like this, for example. Custom metal push button. I don't know if this is quite what you're talking about. So these are buttons with um, different symbols on them. Got to find... Uh, yeah, you can see some there has, well, is that a, I don't know what that symbol is, the yellow one in the bottom right. It looks like there's a rain symbol, there's a like a light symbol, like a high beam. Uh, I think the top left one, the orange one, is a mirror symbol. So, yes, uh, what, what options do they have? Self-locking, remark stock number. Oh, okay. Yeah, so these are some of the symbols that you can get. Please note the serial number. Can provide us with the symbols you want. So is this the sort of thing that you're talking about, dentistries? I've definitely seen these available with standardized symbols. Like these ones are obviously automotive related. Like B5 is washer level one, or, you know, sprayers, that sort of thing. Um, dentistry says, I think you, I may have seen some of those. Been trying to find the same model that you use is fairly shallow. I should keep my search going. I may try and get them laser engraved myself. Mm. Yeah, so you, I don't know if these people... I am absolutely sure you could get them custom made. You can get anything custom made in China. If you could find out where these are coming from, not necessarily this seller. So XZ Global Store will be someone that's just um, selling these on behalf of some other factory. If you can find where these are coming from. Uh, ooh, what's that? One socket, no switch. Okay. That is their cheap way of <clears throat> getting a cheap listing. <laughs> the classic AliExpress trick. Let's see what it's showing in here. Uh, where was it? Where was it? Where's the one with the custom? I don't know. I can't see it now. I can't see the ad that I clicked on. <clears throat> anyway. Yeah. Oh, that's a... That was different. This one. No, this one. System notification, one hour remaining. Now look at all the different symbols on here. So they've got letters, numbers, lots of symbols. Yeah, you'd be able, if you wanted a, a num enough of them, <clears throat> which could be, it might be as few as a few hundred, you could have these custom made, I'm sure. <clears throat> uh, hmm, Gavin says, haven't touched the light switch in 12 months. Interesting. I have a few rooms with a PIR sensor, an ESP8266, and 90 WS2812s mounted above the windows as wall illumination, using WLED program to dim at night like a nightlight. That is interesting. Uh, Scott says, I can't stand 100% automated lights, but I do like telling either she who shall not be named or <laughs> the other one what I want. <clears throat> Hang on, I need to clear my throat. Okay, presence, where was it? David T. Ah, oh, okay. David said, renovated my place recently and hid all my light switches behind blank plates now, iconic. Um, so by iconic, that means the brand, like the, the style. There is a light switch style called iconic. Light switch iconic. Um, yeah, I, Clipsal iconic. Do, 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 do. It's um, it's a pretty popular um, style these days. So in Australia, I mean, this is all Australian focused stuff. Where's just a plain one? I don't know. But anyway, that's what the Clipsal iconic stuff looks like. So continuing um, 
David's comment. Where was it? Okay. Uh, hit all my light switches behind blank plates now and use human presence sensors in ceiling mount to turn lights on and off using some basic logic. Hmm. Okay. Cool. Uh, ZY M100. Single IKEA Zigbee remote to override and dim. Oh, cool. Let's see what the deal is with that. Bonk. Uh, do, 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 do. Smart home scene. Hmm. Present sensor review. Okay. Let's have a look at this thing. Smart home present sensor. Okay, so my guess is this is probably millimeter wave radar. Probably. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Communication protocol where temp working temperature. Does it say? Oh yeah, there it is, sensor. 5.8 gigahertz millimeter wave radar. All right, so it's basically a, a, um, a device that you stick on your ceiling or somewhere, or on your wall, and it can detect when there are people. Yep. Nice. I wonder how much they are. Well, it says $27, but that's probably uh, US dollars which probably means that it's about a bajillion in Kanga bucks. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> uh, oh, David said, um, it's reversible when I sell, but those present sensors work so well, I have completely gotten used to no switches. It just works. Hmm. I think... I should experiment with that. Uh, so Scott said, of course, best would be with a local voice assistant. And when will we see an OXRS voice assistant? That's a good question. That is a project that, um, so, uh, that was a project that I wanted to do a few years ago based on Oh no, I can't remember that I've gone completely blank on the name of it. There is a there was an open source voice assistant project a few years ago that has now gone defunct uh, that my friend Kathy used to work for. What was it? I have one here. Mycroft, that's it. Mycroft AI. So Mycroft I don't even know if, if it still exists. They kind of, they switched to being a um, Mycroft.ai. They switched to being an app company eventually because they um, couldn't um, migrate community. Yeah, okay. So it's now been uh, kind of, yeah, looks like it's just become a community thing now. Said. So what happened to Mycroft? Yeah, what did happen to Mycroft? Um, they, Mycroft was originally, I believe, a Kickstarter, or it may have been, no, it was a crowdfunding project. I'm not sure. I can't remember what platform it was on originally. <clears throat> so they had a bunch of backers, which funded the initial development, but they dramatically underestimated the cost of doing all of the development and bringing the product to market. So they had an initial prototype that was running with a Raspberry Pi inside it. And I actually have one of the original, I was a backer on the original um, crowdfunding project. And it was a... Uh, yeah, so anyway, I got one of the original Mycroft AIs with like a Raspberry Pi 2 or something in it uh, and some audio gear. And they went through a whole series of cycles of major redesigns. Um, they, I, from the outside, I mean, I, I'm hesitating because 
I really do not have very much information to go on. All I know is what I have seen from very much a distance and from an outside point of view. And I don't want to say bad things about uh, things that people did when I really don't know the truth. But it looks like they basically wasted a whole lot of time and opportunities by going in circles when they should have just shipped something. And, uh, oh, Mitchell says it's now Neon AI. Interesting. I hadn't heard of that. And they went through a whole lot of cycles. So they did the classic startup thing of moving to China or going to China and dealing with local suppliers and getting samples made and going through the whole engineering iteration process and then having problems with suppliers like they would get boards they would design a board or have a board designed and then have a bunch of them made and then discover that they didn't work properly and like they went through these cycles i'm sure that there were many of these factors that were beyond either beyond their control or not their fault it's just the way things go when you're trying to create a new product and a new product that is very complicated as well there is a lot involved in it but it's one of these situations where they had a working proof of concept they had prototypes and they couldn't make the leap from prototypes to profitable sustainable production and actually having a product that they could sell so the runway that they had from the initial crowdfunding and a bit of extra investment that was brought on was not enough to get them to the point where the business, is, the business was sustainable. And I think they went through a bit of staff churn. Um, I think from memory, they might have gone through a couple of CEOs and then eventually it all sort of, they just ran out of money. They couldn't keep doing it. So it, um, as a, as a last minute uh, desperate effort to stay in business, what they did was switch away from being a hardware product. Because the thing is that the original goal was a hardware device that you buy, you plonk down in your lounge room or whatever, you plug it in, and it's a voice assistant that does all the things that a voice assistant would do but open source and extensible. That was the goal. Um, but they discovered that in trying to develop the hardware and the cost of making hardware and shipping hardware, <laughs> they, um, they ran out of money. So then they focused on the software side of it. They switched to being an app company briefly. And what they announced was that they were no longer going to be producing the hardware, but what they would do is produce an app that would run on your phone or whatever, and that would be your voice assistant on your phone or whatever device you ran it on, which was not at all the original vision. Oh, Andrew said, didn't they get sued by a patent troll too? Yes, I believe they did. Um, yeah, so there were definitely bad things that happened to them that were beyond their control. Uh, Mitchell says, now Neon AI, check out the post at the top of the screen from uh, Clary Gasper, neon.ai. Okay, let's have a look at neon.ai. Uh, software developers for conversational AI. Yeah, okay. Open source software for personal assistance. Uh, actual language stuff. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, download Neon AI open source software for Mark II owners and developers here. Okay, so oh, purchase brand new Neon Mycroft AI Mark II. Yeah, so you can see here some rent. I assume these are renders, not photos. Do, 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 do. Uh, yeah, so this was the form factor that they were heading towards. They're totally different to the original ones. The early ones looked nothing like that. So the one that I've got doesn't look anything like that. It's kind of like a face. It's much wider and lower. I've still, I've got it. It's in a box, just 
not far from me. I should pull it out sometime. Anyway, so all of this is <laughs> chasing a squirrel based on, was it Scott? Uh, yeah, Scott's question about when we will we see an OXRS voice assistant. So to wrap that, to summarize that, I had been um, barracking for Mycroft for years and really hoping that they would uh, they would be successful and uh, this would become a viable thing and my I kept waiting for that day to come where I could do I wanted to do videos about Mycroft and um, showing how to set it up uh, I've got also some of my own hardware because the thing is that with the firmware that they developed because the original Mycroft was basically a Raspberry Pi in a box with a microphone and a speaker and an amplifier and a power supply and I think that was pretty much it. So you can build your own um, hardware and run the Mycroft uh, software on it and I have all of that. I've got the the microphone array system, I've got yeah all of the parts to build Mycroft like DIY Mycroft compatible hardware. I've got all of that. I've got a whole box of stuff ready to do like a DIY voice assistant project. And it never came to fruition because Mycroft fell over before it got to that point. But it is a um, an interesting thing. Uh, oh, what? David said... <laughs> Austin's keeping account of the squirrels. Today is deliberately a squirrel heavy day. <laughs> squirrel count equals six, says Austin. <laughs> David said, I just bought three Zigbee ZYM 100s for 17 bucks 40 with free shipping. What? Where did you get those from, David? Because I would really like to experiment with... Um, uh, I'm pulling, I'm going to search for this. Was this from AliExpress? ZYM100. Where did you order them? Yeah, I want to experiment with some of those. ZYM100. Uh, Stephen said, would the Coral TPU be an advantage these days? Potentially. So, the for those of you who don't know, Coral is the Coral TPU is a um, an accelerator for doing processing like machine learning type processing on the edge of the network. System notification. Um, Forty five minutes remaining. Hmm. Yeah, when I look them up, they're like forty something dollars Australian. Uh, where did you get them for seventeen dollars? Z yeah, okay. Everywhere I can see, they are $42 Australian plus. Like, at least, that's the starting point. A lot of them are around 45 Hmm. Interestingly, you can also get them in a form factor that is like a... Um, that's round, that clips into a hole in the ceiling, like a... <laughs> Oh, how's your official store, said um, David. All right, I am going to search for how's your official store. Hmm. How's your official store? What? Oh. Oh, no, that's when she. How's your official store? This is one thing that's really annoying about the um, the search in AliExpress is that I searched for how's your official store and it comes up like it auto completes as a thing and it shows me products but it doesn't show me how's your official store. They're not here. It's not here. Where is... So how do you find a store? Sort by best match. No. I want to find the... The store, not products. Hmm. Uh, come on, AliExpress. How do I find it? 
So I think this is it. So if I start typing how's your official store, it shows it there. Aha, yes. Mitchell has found it. Here we go. And yes, I'm still in Vietnamese mode. No. Why have you switched back to Vietnamese? Um, how do I change this? Oh, I don't know. Uh, how's your official store? Hmm. Okay. Smoke detector. Right. Uh, no, that is... Uh, okay. Change language to... English. Oh, no, this is country. Uh, where is... Where is the country? I want A for Australia. A, nope. Australia is not there. What about E for English? <laughs> is this language or is this country? Where? E, E, E. Nope. Uh, English. Yeah, that's what I want. Am I in English now? Yes, it is. Hooray! Currency Australian dollar. That's better. Bayswater. Yes. It even knows where I am. For some reason, AliExpress keeps switching me to Vietnamese. All uh, right. Zigbee sensors. Smoke wireless. Multi sensor. Um, motion. Come on. Come on, Haji. Home automation. Uh, is it Zigbee? I don't know. Hmm. Had to clear browser cache. Yeah, I've done that. This is not a recent problem. This has been happening to me for years. Uh, yeah, AliExpress keeps switching to Vietnamese. Like, and it does it with different browsers and it might be fine for months and then it'll just do it again. Uh, so anyway, uh, cool. Thank you. F thank you, David, for um, pointing me to those where I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time looking at these right now because this would just be you watching me sitting here scrolling through AliExpress but I am going to check that out. David asked if I use a VPN. Uh, no. I sometimes um, SSH tunnel through uh, VMs that I run in the US, but then it would give my location as California or somewhere like that. It wouldn't be putting me into, <clears throat> uh, it wouldn't be putting me in VPN, in uh, Vietnam. All right. Uh, Mitchell said you should be able to add to the URL to change the language. So you do dot com slash n underscore us. Yeah, cool. Okay. I will try to remember that for next time it happens. What's the time? 11.20. I really do feel like I need... <laughs> I'm struggling. I feel like I need either a snack or... <clears throat> that iced coffee. Now, where was I? How many layers deep in the squirrel chasing were we? I don't remember how we ended up getting there. Okay, so we were talking about OXRS stuff and light switches, which got us onto presence detection and then millimeter wave radar and yes. <laughs> uh, Henrik said, do we look at the other AliExpress thing next? Yeah, okay. So, um, switching to that and that. Yeah, so this thing, hang on. I don't really have anything organized for this, but <laughs> let's, let's see if we can get this working. 
So this is a breakout for ESP modules. You can put an ESP12 in here, which is the ESP8266 version, or an ESP32 in here. This is for a, I think this one's for a Varum module. I have a few different breakouts of similar types to this. But one thing that's really cool about this is the way these springs work. They are little rounded bits of wire and it's a little bit hard to see on this camera. It might work better if I put it under the microscope. In fact, uh, I'm going to power up the microscope, which will just take a moment because I've got to hook up that. I've got to power up the camera and it's okay. I will back up give you some context to what the hell I'm talking about here because this has been a very sudden subject change. It is fairly common when using modules like, um, well, here's a board for example with, an e with a Varum module on it. So this is an ESP32, this one is a, just a classic 32. It's the, um, it's the early ESP. And it's not an S3 or anything like that. And underscore creation said superhouse. Those look like flexi pins. Yes, they are like flexi pins. So um, Austin has provided a link to Solder Party uh, flexi pins. Um, oh, dentistries, got to go. Okay, <laughs> thanks for coming along, dentistries. So this is. Hang on, I'll get some. Um, Get some focus happening on here and switch to that. Yeah, I've got to get the right zoom and the right focus and maybe even the right angle because it's a little bit hard to tell what's going on with these. So these pins, if you look at it from that angle there, what can I point with? <clears throat> Here's some tweezers. You can see that right there it is soldered on here and in, on this side, it's in a slot. So the pin can compress in this direction. And because of the shape of it, you can see it's got this curve that comes over here and then it drops back in on itself. What this does is clip into the sides, the castellated edges of a module. And it allows a temporary connection to a module. So I'll switch back out to the overhead camera. <clears throat> It allows temporary connection of a module if you wanted to do something like program it without soldering it in. Now, I'm going to go looking for... I've got to find myself... Oh, hang on. Here are some modules. What are these ones? Uh, got a few modules sitting here. No, that's an S3. That won't do. Now, I've got a pile of S3s there. Oh, what's this one? This one's a classic one. This one, although this one's been... Um, taken off a board, so I've hot aired or something this to remove it. I wonder if this one is in, yeah, so this is not a good candidate. I'm going to grab just a brand new, um, I'm going to stick that there so you've got something to look at. I'm going to grab a brand new Room 32 module, which will be in the clean room, which reminds me, I was going to talk about KO stuff. Is it these ones? Nope. Those are S3s, I think. Oh, I've got to get the bag open to check. Oh no, these aren't S3s. These are just regular old Vroom modules. <clears throat> okay. I've got a bag here with a few modules. So, the idea with this is that you can, ah, oh, no, this one, this one I think is for a rover. Um, maybe I'll get an ESP12. I've got heaps of ESP12s. I could flash Tasmoda or something onto it. <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, and you can see here, this is for a um, an ESP01. I've got 
a bunch of those modules sitting around as well. Not that I've used them for years. ESP12. Where would I have ESP12 modules? That's another thing that I haven't used for years. There's a, the old box of room modules. Hmm. No. <laughs> Where would I have ESP12s? Uh, so just chat among yourselves for a while. You must D1 minis. It's a whole box of D1 minis. Oh, there we go. Here's a pack of TSP-12s. So the KO thing. Yes. While I'm doing this, I'll just mention that in passing. I had a, um, <clears throat> I had a bit of a disaster during the week. The hard disk in the computer that runs my KO died. Um, on, I think it was about Wednesday, it might have been, no, Tuesday. Uh, Tom and I were running a batch of boards through on the pick and place machine. And it was being strange, like it was moving. Um, oh yeah, so what I'm doing here is I'm just taking the module and then clipping it into place because it's got the castellated edges which you can see under, where is it? There. The castellated edges have these little indentations on the side and they're plated down the side. So it's got holes in it so you can put pins in and it's also got the little notch on the side, like the half hole. What this is doing is clipping down. I'll see if I can get this in the right place. Maybe I'll zoom out a bit there so if i put this in here and push it down it snaps into place so the module is now mounted on this breakout board and those little spring terminals are making contact with the edge of um, those castellated edges so this um, this room mod, no, not a room module, this old ESP, um, it's a 12V, I think. 12E, I think was the type. It's years since I've used these. So this one is now attached. So what this breakout does is it's got a USB to serial converter on it and it's got the circuitry for the auto reset um, by holding down GPIO0 when the RTS pin is asserted so when there's a reset connection or a new connection comes in it will auto reset the target board and put it into bootloader mode and you can either you can this is a multi um, a multi device type board so you can use an ESP8266 uh, so in this case it's in the form of an ESP12 module plugged in you can plug in a rover module I think and you can plug in an ESP01 module, the classic little one the, from way back in the day when um, we all first learned about Espressif. They plug in on the top here. And then you plug in USB and it will power up the module. And this should now be a serial port on my computer, which I could then use to flash this. So if I wanted to flash... Um, I wonder if I've got Tasmatizer on this computer. Ooh, I do. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Jack Stack said, so it has an auto snoot booper. <laughs> yeah, it sure does. Uh, I'm just trying to launch Tasmatizer at the moment. Oh yes, here we go. I'll bring this up to here. So what ports have I got? Um, it has not appeared as a port. Oh, maybe I don't have a driver for that particular. Uh, oh, Doug said, how do you hold the flexi pins in place when hand soldering? Ooh, that would be a problem. <laughs> that... Yes, I don't know. I've never actually tried installing flexi pins 
<clears throat> onto one of these breakouts myself. Oh yes, you can hear my voice is failing again. So, uh, why is this not appearing? I wonder if it's this particular breakout has a, um, uh, what the serial chip is on it. <clears throat> Time to have a look. Oh, it's a CH340. <clears throat> ah, so CH340s. Um, do CH340s need drivers on Mac OS? I can't remember. 340 driver Mac. Um, yeah, okay. So I need to install the 340 driver. Uh, come on, come on, scrolling, scrolling. Mac, zip, they provide a zip. That's dodgy. Driver verification. Mm, this is an old, old article. I wonder if I should do this with a different, <clears throat> um, a different breakout, because I have, I do have others. For example, this is the same, this thing. Hang on. Switch to overhead camera again. There. <clears throat> so, this thing is the same basic idea. It's a breakout with these little flexi pins on them. Um, this is a different style. You can see that it solders in so that it comes down, loops around, and then comes back up to the top. Um, yeah, it's a different shape to the this type of pin. It's um, almost like a mirror image. Uh, yeah, so once again, you clip the module down into here, you plug in USB, and it's got a voltage regulator on there, USB to serial converter, wonder what this one is. Oh, it's a Silicon Labs. It's a CP2102N. Okay, cool. I know that drivers for that are not a problem. So maybe I will switch to using that, <clears throat> this one instead. And is that a, this one's for a 32. So what did I just do with that stuff? I had the, did I put it? Oh, I put it back in the clean room. All right, continuing the story. I'm doing two things simultaneously here and interleaving them. The, so about Tuesday, we were running some boards on pick and place machine and it was behaving strangely. Like it kept pausing. <clears throat> so you would do things like um, pick up a part, move it over the camera. Oh, no, it was not a power and a USB-C cable. It was, it's a proper USB-C cable that I use for programming boards all the time. So I know that it's good. Uh, and so same deal. I'm just going to clip this module down into place. So now we've got a Vroom module that is clipped onto the breakout. So this particular breakout does Vroom modules. This breakout does Rovers, ESP, uh, 12E modules, and ESP01 modules. Um, and there are a few others around. But it, anyway, the, part of the point here is if you need to program um, modules, for example, if you are replacing modules in two year devices, um, getting rid of the beacon um, modules or whatever they are then these can be used to pre-flash TAS motor or whatever you want onto the module before you install it on the target device, which then saves you hooking up jumper wires and things. So, um, I need another USB cable. So what it would do is move the, say move the part over the camera, it would take the photo and then it would just sit there and pause for like 10 seconds and not do anything. And then it, it would move again and then put the part down and then it would pick up a few parts and everything would be smooth and fast and then Super cheap. <clears throat> Ostrov says I use the CH340 driver a lot so that will be okay okay cool thanks Henrik. Thanks Henrik 
Um, I am going to have to partake in some caffeine or something uh, with these super chats, I think. <laughs> it's probably about the best use I could put the super chats to is buy coffee. Now I'm just trying to get a, uh, trying to get a USB cable. <laughs> because this is an old style USB cable on this module. Let's see if this one works. All right, so got the module there powered up with the, um, the room on it. And now switching back to here. Let's refresh the, the list. Oh look, now we've got all these ports. All right, slab USB to UART. That'll be the CP2102N. Now, does this work? I actually haven't done this on an ESP32. Uh, let's pick a release, Tasmoda bin. Does this work on an ESP32 or does it only work on an ESP8266? Let's find out. It's a self-resetting device because it's got that interface on it. Uh, yeah, stuff it. Let's just hit Tasmatize and see what happens. So downloading the image, um, invalid header packet. Yeah, that'll be because I've got a, um, <clears throat> uh, I've got an ESP32 plugged in instead of an ESPA266. So. Uh, I'm, what I'm just doing is opening Arduino IDE just for the fun of it because I want to see if I just want to demonstrate flashing on this thing on this. So the machine just had these intermittent pauses. Something weird was going on with it. Um, we got through the job, so did those panels and then the next day but there was clearly something going on it was i was wondering whether it was having trouble because it often seemed to be pausing when it was at the point of um uh doing the imaging like so it would pick up the part move it over the camera and then it would freeze at that point for a while the machine just wouldn't respond and then it would keep going Turns out there that is an important clue to what was going on. <clears throat> so uh, what am I doing? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, okay, so I'm going to stop and tell you this story because I've, I've been trying to do these two things at the same time and it doesn't work. So what happened was Wednesday morning. Yes, Wednesday morning. Came in here in the morning turned the machine on and the machine would not boot. So the computer that runs, um, that runs the pick and place machine, it's a, it's my, actually my old desktop machine. It's running Ubuntu and you know, like it's an i7, it's just like a classic desktop tower computer type thing, an i7 uh, running Ubuntu, wouldn't boot kept coming up, it came up with a, an error saying, um, you know, invalid system disk or whatever. Basically, it could not see its hard drive. And uh, that was when the pain began. We needed to be running boards. We, we have a client who was desperate for a whole lot of boards um, during the week. So we needed to get them done and uh, everything went sideways. So I then started the whole diagnosis process of what is going on with this computer. That computer, that particular computer has three disks in it. There's a solid state drive, which is reasonably small. It's only like 120 gig or something. And then two spinning, spinny disks. And those are pretty old as well. One of them is like a one terabyte spinny disk and the other one's a two terabyte. And the, it's been running off the two terabyte disk for the last couple of years. And the, um, uh, so I tried to boot it off other media. 
Uh, it, I couldn't get it to boot off a, an Ubuntu DVD. It just kept trying to boot off the damaged drive. No matter what order I put them in in the BIOS, and I even unplugged the other discs so that it couldn't try to boot from them and couldn't do anything. Anyway, I couldn't get it to boot from the other discs either. But that's like a, a secondary thing. That wasn't. That turns out that was not the real problem. Uh, I tried a bootable memory stick, couldn't get the computer to boot. Anyway, spent probably half a day just screwing around trying to get the computer to boot off anything, off any other disk, like external disks, whatever. Couldn't get it to boot. <clears throat> eventually, eventually, uh, I pulled out another machine. What did I use? That's right, I pulled out a Raspberry Pi. This was one of this is one of those uh, yak shaving situations that ended up taking me the rest of the day to get to the conclusion of this particular part of the story. I I wanted a computer that I could mount the original disk on. Okay, so for background also I use Dropbox for synchronization of a lot of things. I use Dropbox, a combination of Dropbox and Git. And with those two things, I typically, oh, and also I have Time Machine running. So for my Macs, they're all backed up on Time Machine, which means I should have up to like the last couple of hours of work safe. And if anything is in Dropbox, then it ends up being synced pretty much live. So um, <clears throat> if a computer totally explodes, I haven't lost any work, or I shouldn't have lost any work. I just realized that I can't see the chat because it was in the background, so I don't know what people are saying. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, software to back, the Synology backup software. Right, so I have, and I do back up to the Synology as well, and also I have scripts that use rsync, uh, so I have like lots of backups of things. I've got different layers of backups and paranoia that has developed over the years as a result of situations of losing data. And um, <clears throat> But the, the critical thing was that with this particular machine, I just needed it running because I needed the machine running so that we could build boards, and I just couldn't build boards. And so this is part of the act shaving thing. I ended up wanting a machine that I could um, that I could boot off something else and then connect that disk so that I could see what was going on with it. And I what I do is use Dropbox to store all of the board files and all of the um, system notification. <laughs> All of the open PNP board files, jobs, and panels. Because the way the the most recent versions of open PNP work is they store three files per. This is a squirrel once again. <laughs> um, they store three files <clears throat> per thing. I'm trying to think of the terminology. It's not because I can't say per board because that is a, that has a specific meaning in open PNP context. Okay, so a board is an a single individual PCB, and then so you have a definition of a board which is stored as an XML file, and it has all of the placements and things you would expect. So the coordinates relative to the origin point, the, um, the parts that go on those placements, their orientations, all of that sort of stuff, as you would expect for a single board. So there is a board file, then there is a, um, an optional panel file. So the panel says you have an array of boards and you might have a two by three array or whatever it happens to be with edge rails and certain spacings like if you've got um, like those little spacer things with the mouse bytes in between to keep the board separated it accounts for all of that so you have a panel definition which consists of boards and it can be different boards so you might have a panel that has two or three different boards on that one panel and you can and the panel definition can say i have two of these 
boards here and I have three of these other type of boards here and this is how they're oriented in the panel. So you've got total flexibility about how the panel is uh, mechanically laid out. And that can be at odd angles and everything, it really doesn't care, it's really flexible. Then you have a job file and the job says in my job I have this panel and then yeah etc. Anyway the point of all of this is OpenPNP has these files that it keeps and it keeps track of things like which placements have been completed successfully. So you can have a job file, you, you might be halfway through a job, quit out of OpenPNP and restart your machine and rehome it and do all of that sort of thing, load it all back up again, open the job and it knows which parts were placed out of that job, which ones had errors or whatever, and you can then resume the job or whatever. So, uh, <laughs> yes, Austin says, missed the nine squirrel so far today. So, <clears throat> the all of these files, all of the open PNP stuff, are stored in Dropbox. And so, when if the machine dies, which it did, I don't lose any of that. I have all of the information right up until the most recent job I did, the status of all of the parts that have been placed, etc., for that job. And uh, so all of that is no problem. I wasn't worried about losing that data. What I was worried about was losing the OpenPNP config. Now that defines things like where the feeders are located, like the pickup coordinates, what part is in each feeder, and it doesn't change very often. Um, and one of the big oversights I had is that the OpenPNP config, which is stored inside a .openpnp directory um, in the home directory of the user that runs the OpenPNP program, um, I regularly make copies of that, like I um, I SCP that with a, a, no, a name based on the date to the Synology NAS. So I have historical copies, snapshots of the config of the machine at different points in time. So I had a number of backups of that. This is when my panic set in. Well, not really panic, but just, oh, why did I overlook that? I looked at the backups I had of the config and the last one was from November last year. What is it now? It's March. So it was a few months old. Normally a few months is not too much of a problem. But in that few months, I had made radical changes to the feeder setup on the machine because I did a job for Lachlan a little while ago where we basically unloaded a whole lot of the feeders we put in different parts because we were running special special sulfur resistant parts for boards that go into the um, into his products which go onto food production lines and things so we had all these sulfur resistant parts that were loaded and then i took most of those off left some of them in put new feeders in um, i'd also done some feeder optimization in terms of what parts we needed loaded for what boards are being done. So the feeder configuration had totally changed compared to November. It's, that's not a, a normal thing, but it had happened. And I did not have a backup of my current config. So that then sent me down a rabbit hole of trying to recover the open PNP config off the disk that was in the machine. <clears throat> okay. So I'm not going to... <laughs> <laughs> go through all the steps but this is a classic situation of I didn't have a computer that I could just plug the disk into and run it so I thought no worries I'll grab a Raspberry Pi and I've got a few pies around here so I grabbed a pie and had problems with oh, that pie that I, I grabbed had been set up at some point to boot off um, an external disk not its built-in flash uh, like not the SD card. So I had problems with that. Uh, I had problems with power because I, I tried two different Pi 5s and I plugged in one of them I pulled out of the self-driving car thing that's normally sitting on the top of the thing up there. You can't quite see it. It's just out of the field of view. It's above the Superhouse logo. There is a self-driving car project there from a few years ago. Um, 
from the Open Hardware MiniConf uh, with, the, with a board that goes on it that was designed by Bob Powers and John Spencer and that had power supply and everything in it. So I tried running a Raspberry Pi 5 from that with a different power supply module and it partly booted and then failed and then the power supply blew up. Uh, so I then switched to a different power supply but then that couldn't provide enough current to do that and run um, the peripherals that were plugged into the Pi. I ended up going to a third Pi. Yeah, there was a whole saga. It was one of those things where I found myself soldering a breakout cable to link <clears throat> Raspberry Pi headers to a lab power supply and wondering what the hell am I doing? Like I'm trying to fix my pick and place machine. That's the objective. And here I am soldering header wires onto a Raspberry Pi. I was like, <laughs> how is this related to the original problem? And I, um, Gavin Jackson, yes, there is good news at the end of all of this. So this was all of Wednesday. Basically the entire day Wednesday disappeared in trying to either get the original computer to boot or connect the disk so that I could do something with it. Um, I then went down a rabbit hole of trying to get it running on a Mac and there is a whole, oh, yeah. I, I could be going on about this for ages. There is an issue with cameras, camera support in the test branch of OpenPNP on Apple Silicon. Um, the developed version is fine. Cameras work no problem, but the developed version does not have the latest panelization um, support. And I need that because all of my config files are based on the current panelization system. Anyway, it was one of these things where I couldn't do this because of this, and then that one didn't work because this didn't work, and then that wasn't compatible with this. I ended up wasting all of Thursday trying to get the pick and place machine running again on a Mac. Uh, so the end result of all of that was on Thursday, I eventually got the disc mounted on, what did I get it mounted on? I think it was one of the Raspberry Pis. Yes, it was one of the Raspberry Pis. I got the original disc from the Ubuntu machine mounted and it was showing disc errors. And this comes back to the start of this whole story the machine had been pausing each time it, well, not every time, but most times when it did the, um, the vision processing. And System the reason five minutes remaining. was uh, that the disk was timing out. It, when it does, I had the, I had open PNP running in debug mode, which means that when each time it takes an image on the camera to do the, the part alignment, it writes out a copy of that image to disk for debug purposes. So you can go back and look at, there's a directory and it's got um, the original photo that was taken and then it's got a photo with the overlay on it. So it shows the bounding box that's detected on the part. So it shows where it thinks the part is, like the orientation, etc. And if you're having problems with your vision system, you can go back and look at it and see, oh yeah, this is the photo that it took and this is the outcome. This is the result of what it thought based on the photo. So you can do tuning of your vision system. So what it was doing was in debug mode, it was trying to write these images to disk. The disk was then failing because it had bad sectors on it and was timing out. So it would sit there for like 10 seconds trying to write to the disk. The disk would time out and then OpenPNP would continue with the rest of the job having failed to write the debug image. So, uh, I yeah, anyway, I got the disk mounted and I copied off the config. So I gained a copy of my most recent config as it had been running the day before, which was a big relief because it's got all of my feeder set up and everything there. So at this point, 
I have 100% of my data because the, um, the actual jobs and board files and everything, that was never in danger. They were all very well backed up um, through Dropbox, etc., which also replicates onto my Synology. So I've got on my Synology NAS, I have a Dropbox um, plugin on that. And so every time a file is saved on any of my computers, it ends up uh, saved to Dropbox. And also I've, I've paid for a Dropbox Pro, whatever it is, which means I get full versioning and backups. And that syncs to a, comp a VM that I run in California. And it also syncs live to my Synology. So all of that data is extremely well protected. I can get it, it's fully versioned, I can roll it back. Um, I could delete a file off a computer and then just say, oh, I've changed my mind, I want it back again, and pull it back. Um, so that's fine. Then I also had the .openpnp2 config directory from the home directory. So then, uh, okay, <laughs> I then, contacted um, my friend Matt who is sometimes in the chat here I haven't seen him today <laughs> but he's often in the chat and um, I won't get into this in too much detail but part of his work is he uses mini PCs in a um, in his work and he uses many of them like mini PCs to him are like uh, almost a disposable item. They, they go through hundreds of them. So uh, he, and he had a, a whole bunch of them. And I contacted him and said, uh, do you happen to have any spare mini PCs? <laughs> Could I please borrow one? And um, he ended up giving me a box of them. <laughs> um, well, not giving, but <laughs> he had some around and said, okay, if this is gonna solve the problem, take this. <laughs> so I ended up getting a whole box of mini PCs. They're Lenovo uh, mini PCs. Some of them are i7, some of them are i5. They've got SSDs in them. Um, they're, and lots of USB, which is nice. Um, they're kind of oldish, but they're nice little machines. Anyway, what I ended up doing was um, I erased the disks and installed Ubuntu on four of them. So I now have four computers that are set up for running the pick and place machine. Um, they are KO1, KO2, KO3, and KO spare. So I've got one computer set up for each of the three pick and place machines, plus a, um, a cold spare basically that is ready to go. Each one of those is configured with Dropbox so that the, um, the OpenPNP configs um, and job files and everything are all stored in Dropbox automatically. So if a machine dies, uh, I will have everything up to the last moments of data. They are all set up exactly the same way. Um, and in fact, to be able to tell the difference between them, what I've done is made a custom desktop for them, each one. So it's got Superhouse and then it says KO1, KO2, etc. So if I'm like remoted into it, I know which machine I'm on. So I now have <laughs> the outcome of all of this is that I now have computers running Ubuntu set up for all three of the pick and place machines plus a spare, all with identical configs, identical software and um, it's working. <laughs> it's the big relief. Yesterday and the day before, I was driving around. I haven't, this is the thing, I haven't actually run a panel through yet, but I've booted the pick and place machine. Um, I've done test picks from feeders. Uh, it uh, The cameras all work. It's a big relief. So, um, yes. <laughs> oh, Johnny said, that Steve Squirrel dude is not a mod. That means I should be able to mute him and we get eternal live streams. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, Austin says, I have a Lenovo Mini for the gift card 
ATM as well. <laughs> Great little machine. Now you need to automate config synchronization. Yes, Scott says, now you need to automate config synchronization. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So that is, uh, yes, the config files. What I'm going to do is rsync them. Actually, no, I'm not going to rsync them. I'm just going to CP them with the with a timestamp into the Dropbox directory so that at any point I can always pull it back out. <clears throat> yeah, the, um, the data files for OpenPNP are all stored in Dropbox already. That's covered. But the .openpnp2 directory, which is in the home directory of the user, is... Um, uh, oh, sorry, David, I will get to your question in a second. Um, is just in the home directory. So what I'm going to do with that is make a cron job that duplicates the .openpnp2 directory into Dropbox, probably just once per day, maybe... Yeah, what I'll probably do is MD5 summit or something so that it only copies it if it's changed. Otherwise, I'm going to end up with hundreds of copies of identical config directories. But the thing is that the config on the machine doesn't actually change that often. It's usually just very minor things. Like if, I, if I'm changing a feeder and I've got a different part loaded, then the config has changed. But that doesn't happen every day. Uh, it'll, it could go weeks without the config changing at all. So I only want to take a copy, like a snapshot of the config when it's changed. So what I think I'm going to do is make a script that I'll call off a cron job, maybe just call it like once a day, that does an MD5 sum of the, the config directory, compares it to the most recent copy. Oh, what happened then? Oh, my computer went to sleep. Uh, compares it to the most recent copy, and if it's changed, it'll copy it into Dropbox and date it in the file name uh, so that I can see the history of all of the configs and I can always roll back. So I'll end up with copies of the configs for each of the pick and place machines stored separately. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Austin said, sync to home server in each machine, thus each machine can run each other. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <sighs> Uh, oh, Scott says, I've been experimenting with sync thing between a few machines to sync configurations. Oh, cool. Yep. Um, now, there was a, um, there's a bi-directional, what was it called? Years and years ago, there was a bi-directional equivalent to rsync, but I've just gone totally blank on what it's called. Because I've used uh, rsync a lot. rsync is awesome for... Um, for keeping increment, like just for keeping copies of things. There was a program. System notification. Um, Peter is hangry. Five minutes ago. Yeah, there was a program where you could give it two directories and, ah, uh, maybe I'm thinking of sync thing. I didn't think it was called that though. This, I'm talking like 10, 15 years ago. Um, yeah, maybe it was sync thing but I seriously thought that it was um, called something different. <clears throat> uh, Gavin said Delta copy. Yeah, Duke says async is life. Yes. Oh, Henrik is asking me about that um, flashing board again. Yeah, I didn't download the driver. No, I haven't. Synchronicity says hooks. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, where was I going with this? All right, so <clears throat> yes, my goal is that by having the spare machine that is con already configured, it's already installed, everything is ready to go, apart from having the latest config, what I can do is if the computer dies on any of the pick and place machines, I can grab that spare, plug it in, sync the config over for that particular machine and go. So it should be very, very short downtime. Uh, <laughs> DRBD them if you want to go full overkill ode, <laughs> says Jack's Tech. 
Mm. Yeah. Oh, Scott said there have been quite a few. Sync thing is the current hotness as far as I'm seeing. Yeah. Hmm. Right. There was something else I was going to talk about. Oh, yes, yes, yes. David asked, um, Quick Squirrel, are you doing anything for everything open this year? The short answer is no. Um, uh, I tried, he said, was it SVN before Git? Um, I used to use SVN, uh, which is Subversion, for those of you who don't know. Uh, Subversion is an open source version control system that was quite rapidly gaining in popularity and then Git came along and clobbered it. Um, and anyway, <laughs> that's a squirrel from a squirrel. So short version is no. I At this stage, it looks unlikely that I will be getting to everything open. Um, which I am really, really sad about because I miss seeing everybody. The last couple of years with things like virtual uh, conferences have really sucked because I'm an introvert, but I also really like people. What that means is that I end up, social interaction really tires me out. It just, it sucks my energy, but I like it. And I need to recover. Like when, I, when I've spent a lot of time talking to people, I need recovery time on my own to get my, um, and it, to build my energy back up. And I really look forward to LinuxConf each year as an opportunity to see people from all over the world and all over Australia who I typically only get to see at LinuxConf. There are many people there who I've been meeting up with at LinuxConf every year for more than 20 years uh, and not seeing them really sucks and uh, yeah doji says i'm exactly the same enjoy the interaction but need a big rest afterwards yes that's right and iggy says same thing very tiring mutual social interaction in moderation <laughs> uh oh jack Sex said you're a shy loud <laughs> yeah a shy loud <laughs> Um, yeah, I haven't heard that term before, but that's funny. <coughs> I like that. <coughs> Austin's underscore creation said, wait, you were going to travel? Cuz, it's kind of near me and Scott. <coughs> near you and Scott? Everything open is in Gladstone in Australia <laughs> this year. Anyway, so... <coughs> Everything Open, which is the temporary, potentially permanent replacement for LinuxConf, is taking place in Gladstone this year, which is a town um, way, way up north in Queensland, and it's not particularly easy to get to. So it's also a shorter conference. It's only three days instead of five days, and I don't think there are any mini confs. Um, I've run a mini conf at every single LCA since 2003. So 2003 was my fir the first mini conf I ran, which was the Debian mini conf. And I have run at least one mini conf. <laughs> there was a notorious year when I ran two mini confs on at the same conference on two consecutive days. Uh, so I've run at least one mini conf every single year since 2003 and this there are no mini confs this year at everything open <coughs> and <coughs> the yeah so it's going to be a small conference it's in an out of the way location which is kind of hard to get to it's um, way 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 up north a very long way from me so it'd mean probably two plane trips and then a bus trip um, like a, a significant bus trip not like a quick bus trip <clears throat> and 
if that was all it was, I would still go. Um, but then there are the other things that have been going on, like the personal side of life as well. And the situation I'm in at the moment with the way my work is going, it's, uh, it's hard to organize logistically and financially because if I, because of what's going on with the way my contracting is, if I stop working, I stop being paid and I don't have enough of a buffer to be able to just say, oh, I'm just not going to get paid for a week. Um, so like to lose a week of work and to also have the travel costs and all of the other costs associated with the conference on top of it just means it's not practical really this year. So very sadly, I'm going to break my streak of 22 continuous years of going to every single Linux conf. <clears throat> and oh, Gavin says you could catch a train from Bris Vegas. Yeah, potentially. Um, that's once again, it's a long train trip. And when I was looking into this, there was some worry about whether the trains would even be running. I, I haven't looked at this. I think it was a couple of months ago that I looked and there was going, there were going to be works on the railway lines going to Gladstone at the same time as the conference, which meant the trains wouldn't be running. So the only way to get there was basically to drive or to, um, uh, take a bus. <clears throat> So the upshot of all of this is I am, the chances of me making it to everything open this year are slim. I don't think I'll be doing it, which I am very sad about. <sighs> okay. I am tired. I am tired. I think I'm going to call it. What time are we at? Oh, we're a quarter past 12. So I have <laughs> once again managed to <laughs> waste a couple of hours of everybody's lives talking about random things. Uh, just looking through my tabs. <clears throat> Cadbury factory outlet. Mm. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> I need to arrange myself some chocolate today. Uh, <laughs> Duke says, thanks for wasting my time. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I don't know how to wrap this up, so I'm just going to wrap it up. It feels like I haven't talked about anything useful, <laughs> and I don't think I have. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> you weren't doing anything with it anyway. Okay, so your time was just... <clears throat> It wasn't being used for um, for useful things. <sighs> Here it comes. System notification. Peter is super hangry. 15 minutes ago. I think I'm getting super hangry too. I need to get some, get myself some serious food. Get some lunch. <clears throat> All right. <sighs> Thanks, everybody. And uh, I will talk to you all really soon. So many projects. Uh, so little time. <laughs> so, go and build something awesome. <laughs>